I, I told you last time that chapter 1, verses 2 through 11, gives us basically a table of contents for the rest of the book. So, verses 2 through 4, that's trials and temptations. Verses 5 through 8, that's wisdom and speech. Verses 9 through 11, that's riches and poverty. And so, what I'm, what I'm doing with this series here, it's a three-part series, is I'm just going to take each section and, and sort of compile those verses all together and give one message about that third of the, of the subjects. And so last time we did trials and temptations. This time we're going to do wisdom and speech. Uh, the wisdom and speech is also mentioned in, in chapter 1, uh, 19 through 26. And then it comes up again in chapter 3, verses, verse 1, all the way through 4.12. So that's, that's uh, the largest part of the entire letter of James. So, wisdom and speech. Wisdom and speech. Uh, you like your house to look good? You like things to look nice for people? What I think is funny is anytime we go visit family, we have to clean house first. I don't understand why we need to clean house before we go visit family. And I tell Bethany all the time, I guess we're just waiting for the thieves to come in and think, oh, what a lovely house. <laughs> but we, get, we do. We have to have the dishes done, the laundry done. We have to vacuum and have it all clean and ready to go in case we get robbed while we're gone. But really, she do, her philosophy is, I don't want to come home to a dirty house. That's it. I don't want to come home to a dirty house. I, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> What I, what I want is for my house to look good on the outside. So that, that's sort of my uh, domain. If I want something to look good, uh, I want my TV to look good. Uh, but I also want my yard to look good. So I'll mow the lawn, I'll weed eat, and then I'll edge. And I'll do that over and over and over and over once a week. Uh, and, and just... You know, it, it annoys me to see the grass come over the sidewalk. I have to cut it. It has to be gone. Uh, but I, I'll go around the neighborhood. I was pushing the kids around, uh, around the block. And, um, and there's this one house that has this great yard. It's, it's the, like the perfect yard. And, uh, and so every time I drive by, man, the edge, the edging on this grass looks terrific. Whenever I was pulling the kids, uh, pulling my daughter in, the, in her little radio flyer red wagon, I noticed, man, I think I could fit my entire fist between the gap in the driveway and the grass. That's a big gap. And, uh huh. Yep. And so it, that didn't come from using the edger. That comes from from using a different tool. Absolutely. Everybody likes to have a good-looking house. When we go through the neighborhood, there's that sharp-looking yard, a really nice house. Oh, they got great shutters. That was Bethany was interested in shutters. The lawn's cut, the grass is edged, the weeds are eaten. You just know somebody put a lot of time into this yard, and it's done so continuously. But that didn't. Uh, the thought comes into your mind. Here's what you think. Here's what you start thinking whenever you see a really nice yard. I wonder who they pay to cut their yard. <laughs> that's the first thing. I'll be honest. That's the first thing because it, it seems it, it's not always a labor of love to just get out there. Some people love it. Some people love to be in their garden. Some people love to just cut the grass that comes over the edge of their sidewalks. Uh, but a lot of times you start thinking, they must pay somebody to do that for them. And a lot of times you would be right. Uh, we don't just assume people do this stuff for themselves because it's not the norm. There's nothing wrong with providing a job for anyone else. That's fine if you can afford it. Uh, but the work we have to do on ourselves in our own spirit cannot be hired out. You can't hire that out. That's not a job anyone else can do. We'd like to maintain good appearances on the outside. We like to f the feeling of having a nicer yard than our neighbors. That's a good feeling. Uh, I'm, I heard of somebody, uh, one student said, when my neighbor cuts his grass, he always mows a line into our yard. <laughs> like a little hint that this is how high your grass ought to be 
even though yours is not that short. Uh, yours is a little bit long. <laughs> so he'll mow one line into their yard. It's, it's, it's pretty funny. We like to feel like our place looks better than the other guy's place. And then the neighbor's place. We really do. Um, if you drive around a neighborhood and see somebody with a for sale sign in their yard, you're like, well, why do you have this junk in your yard if you're trying to sell the thing? So you understand that. Um, so like our front yards, we make sure to keep up good appearances on the outside of us. But just like that same front yard, you don't get to see what's happening on the inside. I can't really see what's going on inside of you. Now, my wife might have a good idea of what's going on inside of me, but she doesn't have the same idea about me that I have or that God has because there's no lying, there's no deceiving the Lord. We want to do the work. Uh, we want to do work on ourselves, but it would be easier if we could just pay somebody to do it for us. You know, this spiritual growth stuff, this discipleship, it'd be nice to just pay a bill and have it done. Or maybe say a few prayers and have it done. Like the magic words that we, we lift up to the Lord and have it, have it done. Wisdom is like that sharp looking front yard or beautifully cultivated garden. But wisdom is on the inside and the only ones able to work the spiritual soil are you and the Lord. James is going to give us instructions that we need to keep a clean house on the inside. Wisdom, here's our main point, wisdom can blossom from your spiritual soil when you sow the seeds of righteousness. Wisdom can blossom from your spiritual soil when you sow the seeds of righteousness. The first thing I want you to know about that is that only God can provide the rain, but you must pray for it. Only God can provide the rain, but you must pray for it. Uh, James tells us to ask of God without being double-minded. Look at chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So God causes the rain to fall on both the righteous and the wicked whenever people pray for it. You ever notice that, that... Uh, Sometimes the, the unrighteous get nicer things in life, have an easier life. The Lord can be kind to all of us, regardless of how we are. His grace toward us can be like rain, that it falls on us whether we want it or not. Sometimes that's good. He must ask in faith, verse 6, without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That man not, uh, ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in his ways. In verses 6 through 8, I want you to know that doubters, the double-minded, are like the seed scattered on shallow soil. And so... Wisdom will not blossom from the soil of the double-minded. The people who doubt that the Lord can do that for you. People who doubt the Lord has a plan for the things you're going through. The people who doubt that the Lord can redeem your relationships should not expect to grow wise from, them, from those things. Because the soil is not good soil. Only God can provide the rain, but you must pray for it. You must ask with the right motives. Now, I'm going to jump around a little bit because I'm synthesizing the three sections of James. So, in chapter 4, verse 3, we're going to look on our next section. 4, verse 3. You ask and do not receive. That's prayer. Because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasure. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You know how Christians have shared the gospel best over these last 2,000 years? Over food. 
Baptist have it made, huh? Oh, we, well, we, we got the food part down. Right. Uh, we might have sometimes forget about the sharing of the gospel part of it. But, um, you know, you get a reputation for good food. Maybe you can invite some people over and trick them, bait and switch, you know. We're, we're uh, over here to have some, some uh, pumpkin pie, and you're going to get some Jesus dessert. That's what you're going to get. Um. All right, ask with the right motives. Not to boast about yourself, but to share your harvest with God. Share your harvest with God. Now, we're going to have to think about that for a second. Let's uh, continue reading. Um, Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace, therefore. Uh, therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, resist the devil. He will flee from you. And listen to this. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. You think about, um, put yourself... Put yourself in the first century or in Old Testament times and you're growing your food. It's an agricultural uh, society and you have to grow all your food. You don't just go to the store. Um, So you're growing this. You have neighbors. You share with them. You share with your family. You give thanks to the Lord. And you give your first fruits to the Lord. You know, things start popping up out of the ground. Okay, you've waited, you've prayed for rain. Uh, There might have been a long spell of drought. And now you get the rain, and now things start to spring up. But you don't know what the next days hold. You don't know if it'll continue to spring up. You might just have this first part. But you go ahead and give the first fruits to the Lord anyway. That is the faith that comes out of giving the first fruits to the Lord. And God draws near to the person who does that. And wisdom, or the blossoming of wisdom from your spiritual soil, you need to give the first fruits of your growing wisdom, your blossoming wisdom, to the Lord. Instead of, what does it say? Uh... Instead of boasting about yourself, instead of having the wrong motives, how do you have the wrong motives about being wise? If you're supposed to ask the Lord for wisdom, and you ask with the wrong motives? If you're asking so that you can make others think you're so wise. Yeah, sometimes it's for show. Sometimes... uh, you know, you, you see someone spring up quickly. And sometimes in the church, somebody, you know, you've been going there forever. You've been uh, helping people, praying for people, uh, leading a Sunday school class, singing in choir, investing in your church. And then uh, somebody new comes in and they're just, you know, they're, they're just thrown into the front like a shooting star. And, you know, you're quietly sitting there. Uh, sometimes things like that can be like the seed that fell on the rocky ground and it shot up real quick but then got scorched and it went away and died off. Uh, sometimes you know, it things appear to be the fruit of the Lord, uh, the fruit of the Lord's work that just, sometimes it's not. And sometimes it actually is, and we get proud of that. And, and you want to celebrate with someone. Celebrate with the Lord. That's how you draw near to the Lord. Celebrate with Him. We don't have to pray to the Lord just about bad things. We have thanksgiving as an important part of our prayer lives. And the blossoming of wisdom from our spiritual soil, we should give thanks for that. 
And we need to be wise enough to, to recognize when it happens. So, do not boast about yourself. Do not ask with wrong motives. And share the fruit of your harvest with the Lord. So that's our first point. Only God can provide the rain, but you must pray for it. Number two, only God can provide the seed, but you must plant it. Only God can provide the rain, only God can provide the seed, but you must plant it. And this is the way creation works. Only God can create out of nothing, but we can create something with what He has given us. A plant produces a seed, a seed goes into the ground and becomes something new, a new plant. You participate in God's creation when you do that. Maybe that's why it feels so good to clean up your yard or clean up your house, to organize things, because it's, it sort of reminds us of what our Creator has done. You remember the earth, the earth was formless and void, and He did something with it. He reorganized it. And when you, whenever you clean up your house and do the most mundane of tasks, you sort of do something like the Lord has done. You know, you have to do the work. But very simple things like that remind us what, of what the Lord has done and how we are a part of His image. And being a part of that image is important for James. Um, only God can provide the seed, but you must plant it. So, be a doer of the law, not a judge of the law. And if you've read through James, you know, be a doer of the word, is, uh, is, is what you should be familiar with. But there are some things uh, that James uses, some literary techniques, to help us know that we need to synthesize, uh, be a doer of the word, with be a doer of the law. Um, let's see if I can spot those real quick. Um, all right, 122 says, Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers. Who delude themselves. And then um, it is chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against his brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not doers of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So, uh, throughout James, and I, I can't spend the time that I want telling you about uh, his key words that link our three sections together, but he has a bunch of them. Um, anyway, we're supposed to blend together our message about being doers of the word and being doers of the law, not being a judge of the law instead. So, uh, follow instructions. First of all, follow instructions. 122 through 25 says this. Prove yourself doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of a person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law. Now see, there's our word for law. It's not just be doer of the word, but be a doer of the law. That's what he's getting at. Uh, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed, or woman will be blessed in what he does. So follow the instructions. You go on YouTube, people today, I don't know if you do this, uh, people today go on YouTube and they find instructions. Uh, I have a cracked cell phone, so I have watched a video of how to replace my cell phone screen on YouTube. Uh, so if I want to order a little piece off of Amazon, then I can do it myself for maybe 40 or 50 bucks rather than going through Apple uh, for over 100 bucks. But you need to follow the right instructions. And the law of God, the Bible, gives us the right instructions. Now there are alternative instructions for how to grow a garden, a spiritual garden. They're all over the place. 
But if you don't follow the right instruction book, the law of God, you're going to come out with a garden that is wrong. Focus on your own lawn. Be a doer of the word, not a judge of the law. Focus on your own lawn. Chapter 4, verse 11 says this, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Or people might see someone else uh, and think, oh, that's a hypocrite right there. That's a hypocrite. Because it makes people feel better about themselves. And it's not just about spiritual things. It's about a lot of different things. To, in order to lift yourself up, you try to bring somebody else down. And you can do that with your spiritual life too. So follow the right instructions from the law. And focus on your own lawn. And finally, uh, harvest righteousness using the right tools. Chapter 1, verse 20 says, Put away your anger, your filthiness. Chapter 3, 14 says, Remove jealousy, ambition, arrogance, and hypocrisy. And chapter 3, 17 tells us, Have purity, peace, gentleness, reason, mercy, and good fruits. These are your tools for harvesting righteousness from your, or harvesting wisdom from your garden. So the mere fact of your presence here tonight tells me you want to receive the word implanted. At least that much, you want that. And I pray we continue to, con to cultivate what has been planted, becoming doers of the word. I pray that uh, you sharpen the right tools for this labor. Purity, peace, gentleness, reason, mercy. And I pray that when your work blossoms into good fruits, you share that victory. You share the reward with your Lord. So here's some things to do. Do some spring cleaning on your soul this winter. Do some spring cleaning this winter. Find the opportunity to show gentleness and mercy. Share your victories with the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving. Draw near to Him. Draw near to Him. And disciple someone, showing them the instructions you received. How about that? And if the, if the tongue is a fire, it can burn up your whole harvest. Bridle the tongue, and you can control the whole body as well. <laughs> Let's pray together. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for this day and this evening. I pray that you bless each person here and their families. Lord, I pray that you continue to grow us on the inside, that we have something to share with you. Lord, I pray that uh, the way you are conforming us to the likeness of Christ would be accelerated Lord, that you would bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. That you would be kind to us and our families. Yes. That you would give us peace on every side. Long life, good health. For, for us and our families in the land in which you've called us to dwell. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.